I just got back from the first two Bassmaster Elite Series events of 2023. Of course, Lake Okeechobee and Seminole. And it's back. It is finally back. Jake's Take, the ultimate behind the scenes Bassmaster Elite Series show with Bassmaster videographer, ice climber, outdoor extremist, and all round good guy, Jake Latondras, this week on. <laughs> I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Hard to believe it is March 1st. Hope you're having a great week. Happy hump day to all of you. Want to welcome in all our humpers that listen week in, week out. Your support of this show is incredible and just when I think it can't grow anymore if you look over the last three months it's incredible how much more this show has grown and it's growing because of you the fine viewers so i thank all of you for that but this is a show we've been waiting for a while for um not only is it show 99 or the wayne gretzky show i don't know why i got out of the habit of doing that i used to always do that on ld and the mc i'd, I'd, I'd associate a uh, an episode number with a sports person. But, I mean, you can't have episode 99 and not mention Wayne Gretzky. This is the Wayne Gretzky episode. So, thank you for that. But it's also an episode that we've all kind of been waiting for for a while. Myself included. Some of my favorite conversations on this show happen with this week's guest, Jake LaTondres. Um, what started is something we didn't know that anybody would want to listen to has become, in my opinion, the ultimate behind-the-scenes show of the Bassmaster Elite Series. I mean, between the two of us, we get to see a lot of things. We get a front-row seat to a lot of cool things, and and that's what we do. We just talk about those things and try to bring you guys behind the curtain that is the Bassmaster Elite Series. And um, I thank you for watching. And um, first two events in the books, obviously, Lake Okeechobee. Congrats to Tyler Rabet who won there. And Seminole, the Cowboys, Joey Cifuentes wins there. Uh, both incredible stories. Um, Tyler Rabet, what a start to his season. He's leading, he's going to go into the Bassmaster Classic, leading the Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year points. He's got a first and a third. Unbelievable. Joey Cifuentes, it's incredible that he has made his mark as quick as he did. I mean, he's been so close to big wins in the past, but to get this done and the way they did it, 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 it was very cool to watch this past. Um, I mean, it just feels nice to be back with bass. I mean, um, I'm never one of those people who was like, Oh, I can't wait to, you know, it's can't come soon enough. I, I love being at home with my family. Um, but when I get back to bass, I also, and reminded just um, how much of a gift that job is, and not I'm not talking about the actual work, but it's the the opportunities, the adventures, the you know the things that hopefully one day I'll sit in a rocking chair and be like, well, it was cool to be able to see that or do that or know that. But this podcast this week is show ninety nine, the Wayne Gretzky show, going to be a banger. But I cannot stress to you how excited I am about next week's show. And I shouldn't do this. I mean, because this week's show is a great show. I mean, we set a record in this week's show. Maybe the longest podcast ever. I get it. Some of you will be like, wow, this is really long. We could have broke, broke it into two parts. But we allow you to do that. I mean, you can pause it and watch the next part the next day. But to hopefully it flies past and you're like, how was that even as long as it was? But speaking of flying past, this week, I mean, next week's show Show 100, do not miss it. Mark your calendars because it is going to be a fun one. It's one that I have wanted to do for a long time. It's one that has required a team to put together. But it's happening. And uh, I can't wait to celebrate the 100th episode next week. But before we put the cart before the horse, let's bring in this week's guest. He is a man that climbing a cliff isn't good enough. He's got to climb an ice cliff. He is a man that attending a Grateful Dead concert once isn't good enough. He's attended 67 of them. He is a man that shooting the best anglers in the world isn't good enough. 
He has to befriend them and become their friends and befriend this show and become the ultimate Bassmaster insider, friend of the show, friend of mine, friend of mankind, really. Without further ado, the host of Jake's Take, Jake Latonis. Reunited and it feels so good. I was kind of expecting you to jump in on that, Jake, but I guess not. Back. <laughs> On the show, Jake's take, Jake Latondris. Dude, we're back at work. Thankfully, thankfully so. I miss, I miss all of it. I miss, I miss the boat rides. I miss the fishing. I miss filming. I miss the, the back aches, but most of all, I miss the family. I'm, I do. I really, I miss all my friends during the off season. It's, uh, it, 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 it dawns on me that, you know, how close we are as a group and how much fun we all have together. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good crew to be part of. And, uh, yeah, I miss it too. What is there a bit of an adjustment? Like when you come back is you have, I mean, there's no way to specifically train for your job. You know what I mean? Like to be prepared. Did, did you feel to come into season in shape or did you feel like you need to get in shape? <laughs> Actually, you know what I do? during the off season and during the season, I actually walk, uh, on an elevated treadmill with a 15 pound dumbbell on my shoulder. I mean, Would, wouldn't expect I mean. anything different. You are <laughs> such a weirdo. I love you. <laughs> I mean, you got to show up ready to rock, right? Is this but, a treadmill at your house? Uh, am I, well, I have a rec center right down the street from my oh, house. Oh, you roll up in there with the dumbbell. No, they have dumbbells there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, but you're standing on the treadmill. People are like, "What's wrong?" Yeah, people with think it? I'm weird. Well, I used to wear a weighted vest, but I think people like looked at me weird because it looks like a like a like a a, a vest bomb <laughs> <laughs> or a bomb vest. <laughs> so I just started carrying a 15 pound dumbbell around. Okay, but there well. is an adjustment because you know when you when you get in the trailer, it's like you've been away for three or four months. And then you got to, you know, reset your camera, even though, you know, Wes, our, our, our fairy godfather in the camera trailer gets everything set up. We still have to fine tune the camera to what you're going to see on TV. Right. And it can look different from what you see through your, your viewfinder versus what they're airing on Fox or on Bassmaster.com. So yeah, there's, there's a little fine tuning that goes on. Well, it's, it's good to have you back though off season good very very it was it was a little we got a lot of snow here this year and it was cold um and i'm ready for things to thaw out because now that we've been to florida for two events i'm ready to go fishing dude it's that, horrible just, it really is like you I go know. down there and you it's so quick you forget like you're like oh well this it's summer again you know it's just like all i need is flip flop shorts and a t-shirt and i can go outside and then yesterday i came home and the walk from the terminal to my truck. I was like, uh, it's <laughs> still here. And then we just had, we like right now we're having a blizzard. My kids are all excited. There's a, a snow day. So, um, yeah, it's, it needs to go away, but the, the end is clear is near, you know, we're almost March. Mm -hmm. And, um, I guess we are March when this show airs March 1st, right? Yeah. I get what is today. Yeah. Happy March 1st. Ha happy, happy, happy last day of February. Well, no, but it's not. The show airs in the first. You're True. ruining the magic True. of television. Sorry. 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 Or the <laughs> magic of the interweb. It's March 1st. Happy March 1st. Happy to March. Happy everybody. March. March on. Yes, that's what we will do. Um, I need an update on one thing because we've got a lot of questions about it. And we did kind of leave the fine folks who watch this show hanging. Give me the boxing update. How's it been going? Because I, I think our last show, we were like, oh, we'll tell you about it. And then we never told them about the boxing it. update is very good. My son Walker uh, is still in competitive boxing. He lo he absolutely loves it, and he the he, the biggest challenge for him is he's in the sixty pound weight class, and the biggest challenge is he's only been doing this competitively now for seven months, and everyone else has been doing it for two or three years. So the U.S. Boxing Committee as a sanctioned event when we go to these fights they don't like for young fighters to get matched up with 
experienced fighters because there's such a gap. Even though they weigh the same and they're the same height, there's a gap in experience level. So, you know, Walker's had, uh, he's had three fights now and he's done very well. He's not, he has no fear whatsoever. Um, however, you know, the challenges are he's facing guys that have been doing it since they were five, four or five years old. Yeah. And, and even, uh, some of them even younger actually. So, you know, but he's learning a lot and, um, I fully expect him. I mean, his coach literally has taken him under his wing thinking that this is like my prize fighter, this guy, he's coming along faster than anyone I've ever coached and he pays special attention to him. So that's a good thing. Well, that's good. That's good. It, uh, People got mad at me because they were asking for results and stuff. And I'm like, well, Jake's got to explain it to you. I, I, it's not my kid to talk about. But when he becomes a world champion, I'll totally tell everybody. There <laughs> I go. had Walker from day one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so let's just jump right into the Bassmaster events. And man, you started off with freaking fireworks. Uh, I couldn't have thought of a better person for you to be with on day one. And uh, rather than steal the surprise, I'll let you tell us who you were with on day one of your Elite Series 2023 shooting season. I was lucky enough to be in the boat with the legendary Mr. Larry Nixon. And that was an extremely, I felt honored and privileged and I was so happy that I got, you know, when we got our assignments that Wes had has matched me up with Larry Nixon. And I was just, I mean, I was actually a little bit nervous, which has been, a, it's been a while. Like my first few years at the elites, you know, like being around Kevin Van Dam or Mike Iconelli, you know, I was a bit nervous and I felt that I felt that again when I got in Larry's boat and to my surprise, he was actually more nervous than I was. So that kind of balanced everything out. Yeah. I think that was one of the coolest parts about it because he had said that he said that on this podcast, he said that in pre-interviews that I heard, you know, he said, uh, I'm going to be nervous and I hope I don't have a camera on day one, but how could he not have a camera on day exactly. one? It's Larry Nixon, you know, exactly. I mean, everybody wanted to see that. Um, but I really watched him cause I thought, you know, he's a wily enough veteran that he's going to say the right things at a lot of times. You know what I mean? And you think it might be one of those things that people just say like, uh, Oh, I'm, he really was nervous. He really was, um, which was awesome to see. Awesome to see somebody that accomplished be that stoked just to be back in the elite series. Exactly. That nervousness was a stoke. Like he was just fired up and nervous about, you know, how his day was going to go and, and wanting to do well and knowing people were watching him, not necessarily under a microscope, but people were watching him with big eyes and big hearts because everyone was happy to have him back. And, you know, as you went down the line and interviewed uh, uh, the other pros that were lined up on the bank there at the, at the takeoff, you know, everyone met, you asked everyone how, how, how they felt about it. And everyone was just so honored to be there competing against him. And I will tell you that, that I talked to two people as I walked over to get in Larry's boat, I walked over to Jason Christie's boat and Rick Clun and Jason Christie. I walked up to him and he goes, are you in my boat? And I go, well, unfortunately not. They matched me up with Larry Nixon and his first words to me were, you know what? I don't blame you at all. If, if I had the opportunity to be in Larry Nixon's boat, I would too. Cause he was one of my childhood heroes. And then as I was standing there waiting for Larry to come over and pull down at the bank, uh, Rick Clun, I was sitting there talking to him about it. And he said, he goes, you know, no one has ever intimidated me. Like I never feared anyone bass fishing except Larry Nixon. I never feared Kevin Van Dam. I never feared Danny Brower. Wow. Larry Nixon always scared me in tournaments. So kudos to Larry Nixon. You were, you were in Rick Clun's head. <laughs> wow. I, I have this alternate universe where I think they hate each other. They don't at all, but I, in no, my no. head, I'm like, it'd be great if Rick just hated Larry and, I've at been here age, all these years, level. you son of a. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I I was here. I was here last until you showed up. 
No, it was uh, it was a special thing, and and I was to be shocked. I mean, to be realistic, I was shocked, not shocked, but it was really cool to see the amount of pros that were giddy that like that's Larry Nixon right there. You know what I mean? Like they've all a lot of them have met Larry and stuff, but to see him kind of lined up for takeoff with them, it, it was uh, the moment wasn't missing. You know what I mean? Like you think it's day one of the Elite Series. All the hype around kicking off on Okeechobee, you'd think that could get missed. And I don't think it was missed by anybody. Everybody was pretty excited to have Larry Nixon back on the Elite Series. So what was it like, like idling out for takeoff? Anything like all, all what, what I was could he think like? about, Dave, all I could think about was like how lucky I am. Like I kept imagining him as a young angler. And I remember growing up, you know, watching Bassmaster videos and hearing his Ray Scott yell his name on stage. And I'm just sitting here going, this is like surreal pinch my pinch me. You know, I, I can't believe I'm in Larry Nixon's boat and how fortunate that we all are at this day and age in modern times to have him and Rick Clun, people like that back, like still competing and still having that stoke and hunger to compete. We're really lucky to be a part of, you know, the end of their careers. So, I mean, it was, I get, I'm, I've got chill bumps thinking about it right now. That was freaking cool. Yeah. Didn't go well that day, but it was cool. <laughs> so, explain to me the day how'd it go well you know he was he had i mean as we all know or most of us know that watched it was crowded i mean as big as lake okeechobee is it's just vast it's like being on the ocean it almost feels like you know when you're out on the open water you're on lake ontario it's that big and yet it fish fish is so small and there were so many there was one time uh, on day one when we were in the area Larry was fishing and there's a whole bunch of pros, whole bunch of locals in there throwing shiners at big bass. And, and there were 31 boats within my eyesight that I just did a 360 and counted 31 boats, basically within 200 yards of his boat. And it's like, how do you, how, and, and then, and then you start thinking, holy crap, like, there's that many boats, everyone's catching fish. And then you go back day two and people are still catching fish in that area. Like how many fish yeah. are in Lake Okeechobee? It's unbelievable. It's wild. It's wild. So first fish was, did it take a while for him or? It did. It took him a while, but I think once he got that first, I, you know, I don't remember. I mean, it feels like it was a month ago already. It really does. Yeah. But I, you know, as I recall, he caught that first fish and it was a small one. Um, but it kind of broke the ice and goes, okay, finally. And now it feels like I can just go fishing again. And, you know, he had his pedestal seat up in the front, his, his little butt pad seat, and he was leaned up back against it, you know, casting. And at his age, obviously, you know, you can't blame him for that. But at the same time, he looked so relaxed doing it and he was just casting and the thing that i noticed he was throwing a spinner bait and i don't remember everything he threw but he threw a, a swim bait and a spinner bait a lot and i just remember you know him being really accurate with his casts um and again i just kept reminding myself that there was a young larry nixon at one time and here we are i'm watching it just watching him cast was amazing <laughs> yeah was he quiet in the boat um, I think he was quiet while he was fishing, but anytime, you know, he talked, he, he would initiate conversation. Um, and anytime I asked a question, he always was very vocal and, and, uh, w he did well with the camera. Um, all those things. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. I felt, um, very privileged, but there at the end of day one, as, as, as it would go, his, his day didn't go real well. He was catching, uh, you know, small fish and it took him a while. And there was, you know, durations of time between catches and there were, you know, local guides around flipping shiners into the pads, catching five and six pounders all around him. So you kind of got this feeling like, man, this is not happening today. You know, it's just not meant to be day one. And then 
time comes to go back to uh, the boat ramp, check in, and he looked down. I actually looked back first, and I said, do you realize one of your power poles is down? Just one of them, his, his, his back left one. And he said, oh, no, and he, and he hit the button with his foot, and it didn't come up, and then he hit his remote and didn't come up. Then he looked down at everything, and he noticed his entire boat had lost power, everything. Oh. No, no engine, no power poles, no trolling motor, no electronics, nothing, no horn, nothing. So he opens the back battery compartment thinking, you know, he's, you know, really, what am I looking? I'm looking for something that's, that's causing this, knowing it's probably on his main battery, main source, main power source. And he pulls his cranking battery out puts another lithium in there and starts to turn it over and you could you could feel the compression and the turnover in the engine so he turns the key all the way over and it killed that battery then he took another battery off and put it on you know the main engine cables and started it and it killed that battery these batteries were going to sleep and he had no agm battery to 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 wake those other batteries up yeah so we were kind of hosed and we're and and you could tell he's like oh my goodness like this is par for the course my first day back you know i don't have a big bag i got eight or nine pounds and now i've got if i leave right now i'm still going to be three minutes late i'm done right and so these two local guides and and they had clients with them they troll over to larry that then they both were watching us all day pretty much and they knew it was larry nixon one of them happened to be a an elect electrical uh like he worked in an electricity electrician, electrician. yeah sorry and the other guy <laughs> was a boat was a boat mechanic he installs you know he installs engines on boats and so they both jump in the boat. They finally figured out that there's nothing they could do. One of the guys has an extra acid lead battery in his boat, and and he took it, he, he unhooked it, took it out of his boat, put it in Larry's boat, started the engine, and we took off. And, of course, we were 35 minutes late to check in, so he forfeited his entire uh, sack and zeroed that day. But that's pretty much how – uh, the day went, but I will tell you this, that the, the thing that I was thinking about was this is really unfortunate and I hate that this happened, but I just built, I just had a memorable experience with Larry Nixon that he'll never forget. And I felt a little bit fortunate to be a part of that. <laughs> is that selfish? Is that selfish? Kind of. <laughs> kind of. I mean, for a that, second there, I wrong? felt like... <laughs> No, I mean, it's not <laughs> wrong. Um, and I'll tell you this back on shore. Normally when a pro doesn't check in, it takes a while. You know what I mean? Like the weigh-ins over and people are like, well, where's so-and-so? It was shocking the amount of pros that had mentioned, you know what I mean? The backstage, oh, did Nixon, where's Nixon? You know what I mean? Like they noticed he wasn't back. So it 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 is very cool. And um, I'm glad he got back. And I'm glad um, it wasn't a good day. <laughs> Sorry, Larry, that it sucks for you, but hey, Jake's got a lifelong memory. I got something he, out of it. He's appreciative of that. And, <laughs> and I would like to send kudos to the two guys that came over to help. They were extremely helpful. They had paying clients in their boat, and they took, you know, 45 minutes out of their day to help Larry get his boat going. And, and and you know, that, that was very much appreciated, and, and thank you guys very much if you watch this show. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to them. And thanks to uh, Larry for getting back safe. And uh, it's awesome to have him on the elite series. You know, he's, it's just, it's just really cool. It still is weird for all of us. I think like that's Larry Nixon, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's very, very cool. Um, so day was, two. Hold on. What was it like oh. for you when, when he first came out on stage to the way the first way in, or second, I guess it would be day two that he came up on stage. What's that like for you? Uh, it's cool. Like, I mean, to, to me as being such a geek of the sport, like that's a bucket list. You know what I mean? Like, uh, 
I mean, he's actually from Clinton, Arkansas, which is like across the street from B Branch. But I'm like, there's no way I'm saying Clinton for you. You are freaking Larry Nixon from B Branch, Arkansas. And I did. I really I mean, we talked about it on the show when he was on here, but uh, I didn't really go back and say, hey, do you mind if I do this? But I mean, it's B Branch. I mean, I, I believe all of the people watching here, let us know in the comments, you should it be Clinton, Arkansas, or should it be B Branch? Larry Nixon is from B Branch, Arkansas. That's it's the voice that's carved into my head by Ray Scott and just all the history. So yeah, it, it, um, it was special, but it's weird because when you're on stage, you don't take check of special moments. Like, you know what I mean? Until afterwards, you know, it's weird where you don't, I think you're just focused on not screwing up. Um, but, but yeah, no, it, it was, it's very special. It's, uh, it's cool to have, Larry on the elite series. And um, I, I I love the fact that he's there. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm mean, just like when Denny Brower was there. I mean, I feel like when people say like some of your highlights, well, Denny Brower was only in the elite series for I think two years when I was the MC, but I still mention his victory as one of those highlights because I got to introduce or announce a victory by Denny Brower. Um, and I'd love to do that for Larry Nixon. I mean, I'd love to be part of that. Golly. And, um, and I, I think he's going to have his moments. I think he, um, I think that's the one thing that you look at Larry and Rick and, and quite often anglers advanced in their career or, or older anglers, um, they'll often get painted with the, uh, Hey, they just do it old school. They both have spent an incredible amount of time embracing the new technologies and stuff like that. They don't think that they're not well-versed in everything. Um, they're going to have their moments. Um, we've already seen that with Rick many times and, uh, and I think Larry will have his moments, but, um, yeah, it's just, I think we're all the same. Like, I, I don't think, I wish there was some nicer words I could say around it, but it's just like, it's, it's freaking cool. It's like a baseball announcer getting a chance to, hey, guess what? Babe Ruth's going to play today. Exactly. And, you know, if you announce baseball and you, what? It's, it doesn't even seem real, like, that that he's back. But it's a cool thing that he is. So, um, yeah. no, It's very, generational, you know? I mean, yeah. the, all the young guys and, you know, the, the new technology, and which I'm sure we'll talk about, <laughs> and all those things. You know, it puts things into perspective when you have people like Rick Klun and Larry Nixon fishing up next to them. It really kind of, you know, it, it encapsulates this the, the big picture and from start to finish and maybe not from day one, but, you know, from start to from start from the very beginning to now, here we are and everyone embraces each other. You know, it's just it's freaking cool, man. Yeah, it, it's funny, little weird little things like I'm just remembering this now. You wonder if you give certain anglers more respect or whatever. So when the boats were pulled up at Okeechobee, they were beached along that shoreline. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, when I'd go along and do interviews, it was kind of like an awkward interview position because I'd kind of be looking at the angler's crotch and holding the microphone way up in the sky. Right, right, right. Um, but I was like right at the edge of the water. And there were some anglers that I was like, you know, the mic maybe didn't get quite close enough. But I do remember, like, with Larry Nixon, I, I was standing, like, right in the water. I didn't even stop to think care. about it. I'm just, like, in the water. And I'm like, during the interview, I'm like, what are you doing in the water? You know what I mean? Like, but it's freaking Larry Nixon. I mean, I'm not going to make him right. bend over. You got to do this yes. right. So um, later on that day, I saw um, an 8 and 10 foot gator that liked to beach along that shoreline. So I was just terrified while doing interviews for the rest <laughs> of the week but um yeah no it was it was a special kickoff to the season and an incredible event so day two is that when you hooked up with kennedy uh yeah yes i was with uh steve kennedy day two day three and day four and, and dude to you before you go any further Kudos to freaking you, because um, if you loved watching eight pounders eat a frog, that's oh. the dude that caught it right there. Steve Candy caught the fish, but Jake, your camera work 
in that boat, I mean, it was the right opportunity to right, but some of the best shots we've seen on the Bassmaster Elite Series came from your camera that week. I mean, we had some great shots from some a lot of the other camera guys too, because I mean, they get mad when I always give you love. All the camera guys are really good, and I love each and every one of you. Um, but I mean, some of the stuff that you shot that week was truly, truly incredible. Well, thank you. Um, and I appreciate that, but you know, all I do is point my lens at on in top water is, is a cameraman's worst enemy sometimes, but it's also a cameraman's best friend. Yeah. And some of the blowups, you know, Steve's fishing tactic was very interesting because you know, he's looking for holes and all that vegetation. And if you've never people, for those people that have never been to Lake Okeechobee, it's just choked full of vegetation. You know, the, the openings in that, in that, in the, in the grass are boat trails. Right. And, and those are the lanes and everything else is super thick and they're either pitching into these holes or they're throwing top water. And Steve was throwing a frog, but he was fishing it like a, like a, like a top water swim bait. He was just really burning fast. the frog. Oh yeah. Burning it across the grass. But then when he, when he would get to the holes, he would slow down and walk it across. And interestingly enough, many of the bites came on the closest edge. Like if there's a hole right there, the closest edge to the boat, as he walked the frog to the, to the nearest edge, right when it was about to, you know, jump the lip of the vegetation and start burning again that's when the fish would blow up and so there was definitely a pattern you know that he had going on and it was a very successful pattern because he obviously made it into the top 10 on championship sunday and uh, he did very very well and i love i mean steve kennedy is like he's, you know, when, when things are going his way, he's spastic and he's full of energy and he's like a little kid, like he's really little, like a little kid in an ice cream shop, man, or a candy store. And so I, I always have a lot of fun with Steve when, when he's doing well and I'm in his boat, it, it was, it was really cool to watch him just get that excited, you know? Yeah. Hey, he's. He's one of my favorites to watch. I say it all the time when he's on live. And I think it's a lot of it's, you know, that childhood, ex that childish excitement that you see out of him. Everybody loves that. I mean, John Cox, same sort of thing. You know what I mean? That, yeah. But what's cool about Kendi and I will say Cox, for the most part, if they think it, they say it. And it's just like you've got this unedited stream of consciousness coming out of an angler and you just learn so much from him. But it's to me, it's it's cool to see that happens to all of us when we're fishing, but for whatever reason, we seem to think that elite series anglers are so much more dialed and polished and, and they are when it comes to certain things, but ultimately they're just trying to figure out the pieces and they still get giddy and excited when they catch eight pounders on top waters. I mean, Kendi actually mentioned it at the Seminole tournament. He was like, that might've screwed me up. He was like, I got so addicted to catching him that way. It was just, it's so awesome that he went to the next event and, and tried to force that bite. But um, he is, he is incredible. Like he really is. Um, he's what everything that's good about the sport. You know what I mean? Because in a lot of other sports, I don't know that Steve Kennedy has that much success, but in this sport, he does, you know what I mean? In this sport, um, it's just, it's cool that there's a place for everybody. You know what I mean? And we saw that um, throughout these first two events in many different ways, but uh, I, I couldn't imagine how fun Kendi would, Kendi would be to spend, you know, days with him on the boat. Hey, hey man, I, I'm going to give him credit where, 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 you know, where people don't really realize uh, a lot of these guys get credit. That guy's an awesome boat driver. Like he, and he has a very fast bass cat. He's got an Ezra <laughs> a new one and you know we were we were we were scaring the crap out of 78 miles an hour and we're running through you know those boat lanes through the cattails and all the the toolies and all that stuff and excuse me <clears throat> excuse me he's very aware of his surroundings he's constantly he's a very unique individual and his yeah. mind 
is he's very cerebral and his mind is constantly he's got that you know engineer that the, the brain of, a, of, a, of an engineer, an architect, and he's constantly thinking in, in ways that most people aren't thinking, whether it's boat driving, how he's like thinking three miles ahead, how there's two boats to his left, and he's got one gap he's going to cut through to not cut them off, but to beat him, to beat them to the entrance to the, the mats that he's going to fish and he takes it and he's, he's thinking that way ahead of time. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the things I really appreciate and respect about Steve Kennedy too, is how deep his thoughts are, how unique he is yeah. as an individual and, and, and then how he develops that into his fishing skills. Cause that dude is a freaking straight up hammer, man. Yeah, he really is. He really is. He's and one of the most innovative, pros there is out there it's funny because i spent you weren't even there yet I, I think it was day two you were at the venue but you weren't in his boat yet but but you know quite often most of the conversations the meaningful conversations i have with anglers happen before anyone's there you know what i mean like right. that's that's why i get there early and have real conversations with them apart from asking them how you feel today on a microphone type thing right right um so me and steve talked for a while and he all he was doing was tying on these giant wake baits like they were all like kid you know, i was just joking with him like how much how many thousands did you spend in the off season and he's like oh you know Steve, <laughs> well, julia <laughs> uh, she told me not to order any more amazon <laughs> <laughs> i um, can see him saying that too <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I had to start ordering the buddy's houses uh, he didn't say that that i added but um but we had this, and then I see on live, I'm like, well, why was he wasting his time? I don't think, did he throw those much out there? Or was that kind of, he got addicted you know, to the he, frog bite? And Hey, I, let me say this. In, in those boat lanes, when, let's say like on days three and four, when the field was cut in half and then cut down to the top 10, he was throwing, he was throwing uh, glide baits along the edges of the big, thick mats on the hot, sunny, calm day, because day two, it was day two, there was, or day three, there was wind and clouds. And that was his best frog bite. That's where the day he caught, you know, a 513, a 54, and an 81 yeah. on that frog. And then when it got, when the sun came out and got calm, man, it was almost unbearable. It was like 93 degrees out there, and that Florida humidity was kicking in. The fish had, you know, come to a screeching halt. So he starts throwing this glide bait, a big one in along the edges, along these boat, uh, boat tracks and his, like his first or second cast, you know, he's half turning it and just this thing's gliding back and forth. And I'm going, Oh my God, I hope a giant just comes up and cotton mouse that thing, you know? And sure enough, he raises like a six or seven pounder and I'm sitting there. I like, I was looking outside of my eyepiece staring at this thing going, oh, cause I couldn't see it the way the, the glare was on the water. I couldn't see it with my camera. So I peeked with my eye and it was, I thought, uh Oh, he's onto something like he's getting ready to put his frog down and he's going to start throwing that glide bait. And I think had he seen that on day one or even in practice, he would have gone to that much more often and maybe taken a chance, but he felt so comfortable. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, these guys, we, I have this conversation with them all the time. Greg Hackney had, the, and I had this conversation, Drew Benton and I had this conversation at Seminole, but it's like, you want to do something different. And the urge to do that is telling you to do so because what you were doing is not working anymore, particularly on day four. But you also go back to that old cliche well, this is what got you here. Don't yeah. waver what got you here. And that's the struggle and the challenge they have on, on day three and day four, when things start to slow down. And, and I think from my experience, watching guys compete, as soon as you stop listening to that voice, that's when it gets bad. It, it, like it really <laughs> is wild. Like, and Hey, listen, you're talking to two guys, one guy who points at camera, another guy who yells ridiculous stuff when they catch fish. So we're not judging, but but it's so yeah. easy from the outside to see that 
Like angler of the year seasons are the exact opposite of that. When an angler wins angler of the year, it's not because they're thinking about what, sh what got me here. It's because they're thinking about what's going to get me the next bite. It's so weird that like I've seen anglers go from being that person who wins angler of the year. That is so certain that who cares about a jerk bait. that got me here the first two days. I'm going to throw this or, you know, just subtle adjustments, but it's so quick and so precise and they believe in it so much. And then you see that same angler on a year when maybe they're not having the same level of confidence. And it's that. It's the, well, I can't turn away from this. And it's it's an evil part of sports. You know, like if you stick with the frog till the very end and you don't catch them, people are going to be like, well, you know, you should have tried something different. But if you stick with it and let's say you get three of the right bites in the last hour and win the tournament, people are like, what mental fortitude this person had to stick with it. So, I mean, right. success and failure always is the judge at the end of the day, but that, that is that decision-making to me, that's, that's the, and you can't teach it to anybody. They just have to get there. Cause if you tell them, they're like, yeah, it just messes with them even more. Um, but I am thankful because some of the most awesome footage that we saw on Bass Live for that event was from Steve Kendi and was from people throwing frogs and, you know, some awesome stuff with Cobb and some really, really cool shots. So kudos to the entire Bassmaster staff. But the guy who won the event um, was not doing any of that. He was looking at forward-facing sonar. And how freaking Louisiana is it for Tyler <laughs> Rivette to roll in there when his first Elite Series event looking for lunch? He literally improved it. crappie, Suckle <laughs> uh, which is a crappie if you're a Cajun. Um, but it was funny because the day before the tournament, we had a pre-tournament meeting and I spent, you know, certain meetings you, I, you spend with different people. It's just whoever you end up being with. Well, I end up spending a bunch of time, you know, a good amount of time with him, Brock and Hank. And they pointed out the area and everything. They told me like Tyler goes there every day and gets us lunch or dinner, you know, brings home some sakale after pre-fish. And that's how he found that spot. And that's how he won that tournament. It was um, serendipitous. Yeah, it was wild. Really, it was it, very, it was very serendipitous and and simple. <laughs> yeah, but it's more than that, too, because Brock and, and, and Hank will point out, he showed us the spot. We went there. You know what I mean? And, and we just didn't think that there was very many big ones. But clearly... Um, he figured that out and and rode that to the victory, which was um, which is awesome. I mean, he it's that's the coolest thing about the Elite Series. You look at how different his life was two weeks previous to this. Um, exactly, he's going to roll into the Bassmaster Classic, leading Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year as an Elite Series champion, full hot of off a confidence. third place finish, full of confidence, and all of this happened. About a, a month week. after he lost his sponsor. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, so that's what's the yeah. coolest thing that nobody's really stopped to talk about. But that whole, like, his logo on his thing, you know, TR and the, the bicep thing. He put that there because he had another company's name there. And they, you know, no shade to them, but they made a decision to go another direction. But it's like the coolest thing ever that he bet on himself. And, man, that bet is paying off. It's It, it was... It was really, really cool to see him win and, and to see his family win. Like his family comes to every single event. So it was uh, it was definitely one of the coolest uh, victories, but doing something that totally different than anybody else. But I would almost say that it'll never not be done again at a Bassmaster or a tournament on Okeechobee. People will be checking those fish there and everywhere else there's mm -hmm. the outside of the box is going to become inside the box now because of you know that i mean that's the same thing that Milliken did at ohiv you just stumble across these situations and in the in the midst of all the controversy about front facing sonar one of the things that i was thinking about when i'm out there in the in the in the trenches with Steve Kennedy throwing a frog in a glide bait and flipping beds, Tyler Ravitz out there smoking big ones, you know, with a drop shot or a jerk bait in his front facing sonar. And the most interesting thing about that is that while everyone else was going after, you know, 
or using this very similar techniques, doing it the, the old fashioned way, the traditional way of fishing Lake Okeechobee, he's over there doing it like he's at Lake Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and to me, while some people may criticize that to me, that is a different out of the box way of thinking. And he won, he won a freaking tournament and he damn near won uh, Seminole. Like he was, he was, he could have easily won Seminole and he wasn't necessarily doing that all the time because no. he was mixing up his techniques. So, you know, don't give me that, that front facing sonar crap. And, you know, I mean, that, that was, that was, he showed, he showed his versatility and his confidence and all the things that come together when, when you have that kind of momentum, he should, he really, I thought Seminole was more impressive because he finished in the top three yeah. and could have easily won that tournament. Yeah. And, and showed up. I mean, what does that even feel like when you show up the Monday when not even 12 hours previous, you won your first elite, you know what I mean? You no time to you, you no do time all the media celebrate. stuff. Like, you know, people don't realize what happens. Like they win. They're immediately interviewed. Then they try to spend a little time with the fans that stick around and, and get pictured and everything. Then they're on the water taking pictures. They're Sega, doing videos yeah. for every single company they work with and pumping out all this content. And then he has to get on the road and drive six hours, um, which I don't know anyone that made it in six hours. It was a six hour drive in your GPS, but it was like Frogger through traffic. So right. it, it, everybody, it took forever. Um, and then to focus and and get on to the right, it just shows how important momentum is. Um, one of the funniest things that happened there, though, and it, it it's weird how some stupid little jokes start throughout the week. Like he had been flexing, which, to be honest, I've been asking him to flex for the longest. You know what I mean? Because that's who he is. Yeah. He's like a gym rat that fishes tournaments. Um, clearly, he's just been waiting for the right moment to drop the gun show. But so the funniest thing was earlier in the week, I just and. You know me, dude. Half the crap that comes out of my mouth, it's not thought through. I mean, I wish I was that professional. It just comes out. But so on stage, I think on day two, I'm like, I saw you flexing today. If you win this, will you go full Hulk Hogan and rip your jersey off? And <laughs> and he said, yes, of course. And to be honest, when said moment came, I was like, I tried to give him every out. But I did notice on stage he had already cut like the top of it. So I'm like, dude is ready to rip his Jersey off. I mean, clearly he's given me every sign, but off mic, I said, are you sure you want to do it? And he said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing it. And it was funny. Cause then there was a weird little moment that his parents started saying, well, you know, no, no, you need to get pictures and you can't rip off your Jersey. And, and I started thinking, okay, it's not going to happen, but I was going to ease that direction and let him get away. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to do this. Right. And then the part that nobody heard was Brock and Hank. They're on the stage with his family in this celebratory moment. And, you know, mom's saying, don't, don't do it. We need pictures and this. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, he needs pictures. And there's sponsors actually in the crowd yelling stuff up photographers. And then all you hear Brock and Hank go is he's not doing it because he can't. And it was like, <laughs> it was like something. Dude, nobody was hearing anything. They ripped his jersey off right away. Um, but I, I thought, um, I thought it was it was fun. It was awesome. It was, you know what I mean. Like it, it was memorable. That's for yeah. Sure. It was memorable. <laughs> it was memorable. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, how many times do you win a tournament that big, and how many times do you have an opportunity to, you know, to to, to live out this dream you know, you think about what you're going to do on stage a million times until it finally happens. And typically you don't expect it to happen when it happens. I've never done that. So I don't know. I'm just assuming, you know, and, and, you know, why not do what, what you, you thought you were going to do when you got up there on stage, it's an opportunity of a lifetime, right? A man of his words. And, and yes. he, you know, he did all the, there was plenty of pictures and holding the trophy and did everything. This was Got his at the very there. tail end of it. And I'll be honest, the only thing that went through my mind the whole time, I'm like, and I haven't even talked to him yet. I'm like, oh boy, Matt Robertson is going to light me up <laughs> over this because I mean, he obviously got fined for taking a piece of clothing off, but if you can't see the difference between the bottoms of your pants, <laughs> taking your pants off and taking your shirt, I mean, just, 
it's very there, different. Um, yeah, and there's not even a comparison in a world where people will always point fingers and be like, you know, we need more personalities. We need more of this. That you were watching a personality come out. I saw it this week. If you listen to his interviews in that winning moment versus his day one way in interviews, that is a different dude. Like the confidence of winning and every it's like his voice went up several octaves. You know what I mean? It's like, he feels like he belongs now. And, and you know what he does belong and has for a long time and kudos to Hank and Brock, because I will say this from day one, they've always gone out of their way to be like, Tyler is different. He is not what you think. You know what I mean? Like, cause he was a very consistent, you know, like, you know, made a few classics consistent, but very rarely was threatening for a title. They've always said that, I mean, he's got that in him and they were right. And, and, you know, Hank, I saw Hank uh, right when we got back to the weigh-in for day four and he was just standing there and I said, Hey, Hank, what's up, man? He goes, dude, I'm fixing to go up there and watch my boy, my brother win this trophy and his enthusiasm, Hank Cherry's enthusiasm for Tyler Rivette when knowing he was going to win that trophy, like it, it was almost like he was his dad or his brother, like a family member. And I remember Brock cutting through the boat, like where the drive through was occurring when, uh, uh, you know, before Tyler came up on stage, Brock cut through there and he grabbed me by the shoulder and he goes, can you believe this, man? This is freaking awesome. And he was going backstage to come up with Hank, you know, after you announced him as the winner. And, you know, those are those moments where the camaraderie and the, the brethren of those guys really shines and what it means to them. Cause everyone knows, no one knows how difficult that really is better than those anglers do because yeah. they go through this stuff every, you know, every tournament and every, they live out, you know, all the, all the, 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 the sacrifices they made, their families, the support their families have given them. It all comes out at that moment. And, and I, I, you know, I mean, I always feel like the most, the most dramatic thing that happens on stage is when they win their first trophy and the tears come out and they can't help it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I just love that. Yeah. And Hey, Brock, it's funny how, cause I saw those moments with Brock and mm -hmm. it's so cool, but I have had several media people like say to me, this gotta be tough for Brock to watch. I mean, five times he's been second place and now his buddy who hasn't been there near as long as him wins, but dude, kudos to Brock. Brock is a friend. Like he was literally, you know, his is coming, but, oh, but yeah. you know, to, 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 Oh yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. if there was any of that in Brock, I think we would have saw it and we didn't, you know what I mean? Like Brock was nothing but happy for his, for his brother. So kudos to him. Um, kudos and to Hank that too. Yeah. Hank too. I mean, he's won two classics, a back-to-back -back classic, and that is an extremely extraordinary feat, but <laughs> you, you, he was still wants to win a blue trophy, right? And, and for, to him, for him to have that enthusiasm as well, it, it, like you said, it's really, really, it's extraordinary to watch how supportive they are of each other when that happens and, and how, 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 how memorable and unique that is. I mean, yeah. we know, cause we're around these guys all the time and we know what kind how they struggle and, you know, the ups and downs and really go back to the podcast with you and that you did with uh, Ben Milliken the other day, man, he, you know, you asked him a question about like, what do you, what do you stand to gain or what do you stand to lose from fishing these opens? Like, or do you expect this to be good for your YouTube and all the things that you've built? And his answer was, Hey man, everyone knows that you could win angler of the year one year and then turn around the next year and bomb. And, you know, everyone has good tournaments. Everyone has bad tournaments. So really, if I look at it like that, I can't, I can't feel the pressure because this is fishing and anything can happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, like the Millican interview and stuff, it just screams to me, happiness in life comes from what you want, not what other exactly. people want. You know what I mean? It, it 
and I'm I'm not going to speak for Tyler. We'll have him on here. I'm sure sometime soon, as soon as um, I hate chasing them right after they win because there's 700 do. podcasts that very respectful of and, that too. Well, I do. I just feel like, I don't know. I just feel like I, I don't, you know, I know what pressure is on them. Um, and I also, you know, I want to have them on like in a regular week when they're not just going through the, like, I feel like what happens with those champ interviews is it's, you get in a pat. It's normal. It's like a press You get in a pattern of telling, you know, this story that you've told a bunch of times. So, I mean, we tried to be a little different, but um, I don't even know where I was going. I had a point before we got off in this. Um, oh, so I'm not going to speak for Tyler, but you know, there has been people on my social media that have said stuff about that victory that have said stuff about him taking his shirt off. And if you're offended by that, I'm sorry. The dude was just celebrating. You know, we see celebrations like that. I mean, Hulk Hogan did it my entire life. So maybe that's why I, I found it, but anybody that's hating on him for winning on forward facing sonar, that, that is the biggest sour grapes you can ever, I get it. You don't have to love it. There's a lot of parts of it that I don't love as a bass fishing fan. At times I didn't feel it as bad as Okeechobee because they weren't all doing it. One dude was doing it. And then we'd go see, Steve Kendi catch an eight pounder on a frog. And then, you know, so it didn't stand out as, as bad, but I mean, literally that's like dirting some, like if you hate frog fishing, Oh, well, that's not a real victory. You did it on a frog. Like the world needs to get better. So that's all I'm saying. Like, I, and I don't want to start an argument with the fine people that listen to this, but think about it. That's a real person who's worked his entire life. This is a dream. Think of whatever your dream is. And it's just gross how we live in a world where people just want to hate and jealousy, man. Yeah. It's just, it's, Dude, it's wild. It was everything he did was well within the, 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 the rules and regulations of the tournament. Every single guy out there with the except, you know, most everyone out there has the same opportunity. They either have live target or mega live or, or uh, a live scope everyone has the same opportunity and how much you want to bet now you know people are going to go check spots like that at every tournament even though they may dwell into the traditional sense of bass fishing people are going to start having that in their back pocket and if the big fish are there a traditional guy if he sees them you think he's going to leave six five six seven eight pounders to go you know throw a spinner bait in the Cypress knees because it's traditional. No, they're there to win tournaments and, and kudos to him because everyone had the same opportunity yeah. to do that. He ran across it and he used it to his advantage and he won the tournament. There may be a day where, you know, seeing them like that digitally isn't within the boundaries of the the rules or regulations of you a think? tournament series. I don't know. I'm just saying there might be. OK, and if there is, then then that will be that. But right now it's well within it's all part of the game and technology. You know, I know this is beating a dead horse. And like you said, I don't want to get into it either. And there are times when, you know, I like watching traditional fishing better. But at the same time, you know, technology live scoping or, or that active, active uh transducer live at live technology yeah live technology you know i mean who's to say that's any different from the gap between flashers and and side view or, or down or down view you know i mean it's it's all relative and you know just stop the hate man let's just yeah we don't have room for that not in today's world we're bass fishing man yeah it's um it, I mean, the name of the job is to catch the 20 biggest bass you can catch over a four day period than anybody in that tournament. He within figured out a way to game. do that within the rules of the game. There's, if you don't like it, cool. That's it's like That's people fine. who used That's to choice. bitch about Tiger Woods winning tournaments because he could drive further. Well, he couldn't drive further just because he was born being able to drive further. He could drive further because he was born with a natural talent and he worked his ass off to get to be the golfer that he is. And, and Tyler Rivette has literally done that. So 
let's just think about that sometimes you know what i mean it's just it's it's foolish like you know how much more of an advantage is forward facing sonar than being scott martin and having your entire life on that body of water and that's somebody right. who tyler beat and and that's not shade on scott it's just like at some point everybody's got their advantages their disadvantages tyler was just that week he was smart enough to stay in that area and capitalize on what he had found and um and, and it's weird because it's like I've said several times, there's part of me that's like, I love the Steve Kennedy stuff that went on that week. I love all that. Like to me, that's what made me fall in love with the sport of bass fishing, those blow ups, those, you know, I, we remember all of those. So there's part of me that's like, yeah, the live technology makes it less exciting. But then there's also part of me that's like, maybe that's the future. Like maybe that's the next big wave of people coming to this sport because they're younger and they can identify with that. Um, and I also, here's the other thing. I was talking to a photographer and he said to me, he said, Hey, and this guy was sixties. And he said, I I'm, I was asking about different technologies and cameras coming out. And he's like, you know what? I I'm not doing it. He said, I'm, I'm good. I'm good where I'm at shooting pictures. Like I've decided that I don't want to, go any further and that's his choice in photography and it's your choice in fishing it, it it is what it is but it's i think it's just the social media thing people hold on to something and they feel it's their need to hate you know what i mean like it's it's pretty wild think about but, how much we learn from that oh yeah like the education behind forward-facing sonar there are fish you know there are there are big nomadic fish or or fish that are just sunning out in the open water that people never knew were there. And it, yeah. the education behind that to understand the species better helps you understand the game better. And even let's just say forward facing sonar went away tomorrow. There are people that are going to take the knowledge they learned from forward facing sonar and apply that tradition to, to traditional fishing, knowing there are fish in these locations that, you know, on these primary or secondary points at the mouths of creeks or ditches where it's suspended over 25 feet of water and five or six feet, five or six feet down. People are going to, you know, start looking for those fish, even if forward facing sonar went away. So the education that's given us, I think, is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's everything. It's music. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people who tell you today's music sucks. It's not right. You know, and, and I don't know that I totally disagree in some situations, but a lot of that's <laughs> just when you. What you fell in love with, you know what I mean? It's what you it, it, it's what you love, you know what I mean? And it's part of aging. It's part of anyways, enough about forward facing yeah. technology. Kudos to Tyler Rivet. Um, a man Good of job, his word, Tyler. Good ripped, job, off, Tyler. <laughs> ripped off his uh, his shirt, and uh, Zona prompted me to continuously yell, well, well, it's the gun show. But people were at the way in this past week with, well, well, it's the gun show shirts, which in itself is is pretty cool. I mean, they may have been related to Tyler, but still pretty cool that um, it's, uh, it's just cool to see somebody take his career in his own hands and uh, and kick ass. So kudos to Tyler. Um, uh, I wonder if that's a, if you get known as the guy with arms, is that like a curse or a, or a gift? You know what I mean? Like if you, like if you tell somebody fish. their nicknames flex Dude. well for the rest of their career, they're going to have this pressure to always be lifting weights or one year you're just, why don't they call me flex anymore? <laughs> we're a 50, 50 world. Everything turns into a, you know, we're split down the middle. Some people like 50% of the people like it. 50% of the people yeah. don't, you can't make everyone happy all the time. You just, just be yourself, do what you do the your best, be humble. And some people may think that that's not very humble, but you know, everyone knows that everyone knows that, that, you know, these guys get humbled way more than they, when they, when, than they don't. Right. Yeah. Because they don't win very often. Right. No, and dude, how is it not humble? I get it. Okay. He's flexing his arms. You know what I mean? Like 
trust me, if I had him, I, I the gun show would be happening all the time. He's <laughs> like he earned him. He earned it. And Dude, uh, that doesn't you don't you're not born with guns. You have to work hard at that. And it's a dedication to get that. So yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. So kudos to him. A great tournament, a great event. Thank you to everybody from Okeechobee, Florida. We had phenomenal crowds as always. And I'll be honest, bigger crowds than I expected. I mean, Okeechobee Same. is an incredible body of water, but it's the incredibly spoilt part of the world when it comes to tournament fishing. There's a lot of tournaments there. So they've all seen way on weigh-ins. And in my experience in the past, we've had decent crowds, but it's, it's nothing like the St. John's river. It's nothing like some other fisheries we go to. I will never say that again. Cause Okeechobee showed up. I mean, the, the way, like even when anglers were coming in, anglers were saying like, it felt like the classic because it was a unique venue where you could get around a lot. So where the anglers pulled in, all the spectators were back there watching them bag their fish. And, and how cool is that just to see this amphitheater of, of oh, people damn. cheering you on as you unload your fish. Then they come on stage, all those people, you know, weigh-ins show changes, they move to the front, but it was, it was a, a great crowd, a great event. And, um, I hope to go back there very soon in the future. Um, so you didn't win you over on I your did, season. I'm over, 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 over. I felt, I felt, that's okay. I felt, felt tones of you just making your own excuses when you gave that ah. little speech about how you can be angler of the year, one year and next year. <laughs> <laughs> cameraman of the year one year and then you can be the, you can be a lucky rabbit's foot one year and a freaking banana peel the next <laughs> yes so next event um we go to seminole which another body of water we haven't been in a while um a historic body of water with uh, so God. many amazing things and um yeah what a freaking fishery that place is it really is wow. it really is um who'd you fish with that who were who are you shooting there homeboy drew benton that's right and dude the emotional the emotional drama that was going on inside himself before takeoff he cried he cried like i was shooting the interview i did can, hey drew can we sit down and do a you know a pre-takeoff interview talk let's just talk about you know your your childhood here and and you know what this means to you he couldn't even get it out he started crying before he could even say the first word and then he gave like literally like 10 words and he turned away and walked to the front of his boat and was like can we do that can we can i can i you know regain my thoughts and settle down a little bit and we, we'll reshoot that i said yeah we'll do it on the idle out so we reshot the interview again and he was way more collected and kind of gained his thoughts and and it was, it's always an honor, whether it's Lee Livesey on Lake Fork or Drew Benton on Lake Seminole or, you know, whoever, whoever the local favorite is on whatever body of water, it's always an honor to be in their boat because it's a dream come true for them. And you know, that's where it started. That's where they, they drew, how many times has Drew Benton, you know, made a cast late in the evening on Lake Seminole when he's 16 years old thinking, you know, this is the Bass Master Classic. I'm on my home lake. I got five minutes to weigh in. It's just like, you know, dreaming about walking up to home plate with the bases loaded and you're down by three and it's the bottom of the ninth inning. There's two outs and you're the guy, you know? And so it, it was really, really cool. It was really fascinating because I, I feel like I got a locals tour, you know, the best guy on that lake for years, uh, it, it, even as young as he is, he's an elite pro and a good one at that. And I got the full tour of Lake Seminole, at least his, his stomping grounds and the, the diversity and, and variety of ways to fish on lake seminole is i love that place now that's the first time i've ever been there and i love it yeah it's a, it's a phenomenal body of water and and i think one thing that stands out and this isn't shade on the drews this isn't shade on scott martin the johnstons or anybody that i'll throw into this group i think what we've seen these first two tournaments and what we've seen happen so many times is even more reason why people should look at Lee Livesey and be like, wow, what he's accomplished 
it's easy to point your finger and be like, well, yeah, well, it's four key he, he guides there. Yeah. Every day. Blah, 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 blah. Nobody knows the St. Lawrence River better than the Johnstons. They've won it once. Nobody knows, um, you know, all these bodies of water. Scott Martin, you know what I mean? I mean, he, he is. I mean, if you Google Okeechobee, I bet you it doesn't take a page to run across the Martin name. You know what I mean? They're synonymous with that. And then, like I said, this isn't any shade. Winning at home is incredibly difficult to do. It's um, it's so hard, and that's what makes what what Livesey's done even more amazing. Dude, that that I almost said that when we were talking about you know Lake Okeechobee. I almost brought Lee Livesey up because it, it people don't understand. Yeah, he's got a lot of different options. He knows the weather patterns, the wind direction, all the the sun the 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 moon and the clouds and yet sounds like a you, song <laughs> <laughs> it should be a luke bryan song right <laughs> so when you go to these places these locations that you're counting on and there's three other boats sitting on it and you can't get to it you actually end up going fishing in places you didn't want to go and for, and again for lee livesey to, to win those events on, on Lake Fork, knowing the pressure and the pressure that you feel Buddy Gross at Chickamauga the pre and Drew Benton at Lake Seminole, that pressure is extremely high. And it's not because everyone else is expecting them to win. It's because they're expecting themselves to do really well. And they don't want to, they don't want to come in, empty handed and they, they don't want to really at the end of the day, they don't want to embarrass themselves. Yeah. So, and, 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 you know, Scott Martin had a phenomenal day one on eight Lake Okeechobee and Drew Benton had a really, really big day, uh, day one on Lake Seminole. I mean, he did, and he was going to places that he wanted to fish and there were already boats either had, had already combed through there. And then yeah. you look up and it's someone like, Gerald Swindle or Jason Christie just went through there and you're just like, okay, well, <laughs> let's go somewhere else. <laughs> and that's, that starts spinning in, in their heads, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think you start them. overthinking it. Like you start thinking, okay, well, they're on all this stuff. So where aren't they? And exactly. then you start going to stuff that not only isn't the first stuff you would have gone to catch a fish. If you were just out there for fun, it's you're trying to overthink, you, you know what I mean? You're trying to use your advantage and your advantages start becoming a disadvantage because whatever angler is on that spot and other spots, they're only thinking about those spots. They're not juggling all the pieces that are your memories on that body of water. Yeah. They tend to over, they complicate it and they, they tend to not keep it simple. I would say this being with Drew, you know, I was with Drew at, at, uh, Cayuga, his rookie year. And he spent a lot of time on this one particular bed fish, like an hour and a half trying to catch this bed fish. And he finally did. And it was like a two and a half pounder, which is a pretty decent fish at Cayuga. But, you know, I start, I started thinking about that when he was spending a lot of time on some of these bed fish, but man, Drew Benton is solid. He's a very good oh, wow. angler. That's his home body of water. He went to places and, and I remember this one particular spot. He goes, I, I located a big fish on this bed, but I can't see it. And it was off of a point away from indicators like, you know, a clump of grass or, uh, you know, a stick sticking up or a stump or whatever it was. He couldn't see it. So he literally had to eyeball it and line himself up the old school way and get in the right position with the sun at his back and, you know, the wind in his face. And he cast it across there. And I think it was a seven pounder. He ends up catching, guessing where that bed was. I think he caught the buck first and then he ends up catching a seven pound female. And it was like, you know, this is why I'm glad I'm here with Drew right now because this is that was a phenomenal catch, and and and, and it, it's just impressive all the way around. And taking shortcuts through some of those, you know, it's just it's just it's just fun. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. And I talked to Drew, both Drews, after the event um, when we were doing live coverage, 
And I think he explained it best because uh, I said, you know, they were both kind of bummed to be there doing live coverage. That's not the way they envisioned this tournament going. And uh, and I said, man, it's it's not easy, dude. And and his response was like, yes, it is. But we make it hard. And that is exactly what ended That's up happening in that situation. Um, but I mean, it, I, a great tournament, a very different tournament. So Seminole, you. Were you with Drew the whole time? No, obviously not. You weren't with him on the five. Like you were him with him, what, the first two days? Yep, the first two days I was with Drew because he was in fourth or fifth, I think, after day one. He had like 20 and a half pounds. Um, then So I was with him on day two, and it just didn't go as well for him. He, you know, the fish were there. He just couldn't get the bites. And it was a completely different game. I mean, he was – fishing the same way, seeing big fish on beds, catching small bucks, couldn't get the females to go, searching around. The water was muddier where he was, so he couldn't see as well. We moved around a lot more, but just didn't, didn't go his way. And, you know, you always feel bad as a camera guy when things are going well. It's easy to, you know, it's easy to, to, to help create more enthusiasm and keep that momentum going and be a part of the, sh uh, of the show and, you know, do your best and, 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 and help, help their day, you know, become a highlight reel for television and all that stuff. And then when it's not going so well, you know, you feel it too. I feel, I feel it with them. Yeah. And I feel I get quiet and I, I try to let them think and, you know, wonder what's I don't want to be I don't want to be a you know say something wrong so I just keep my mouth shut and and you know it just sort of unravels from there so I don't know if it's day one or day two but something that happened on the water that I mean didn't get reported a lot a little bit we saw some of it but Ray Hanselman um Robin's <laughs> race and what what did you see of that so uh I think day two was that day one or day two i don't know if it was day one or day two but just to be more professional with this job bray hanselman's boat ended up out of the water on shore um and got back in the water just to in the woods danger like like so whatever day it was we were maybe two or three boats behind him but he was far enough ahead of us that we didn't see exactly what happened but when we came up on this you know mess you could clearly see ray's boat up in the woods engine out of the water i could see the prop shining the boat's like there's big he's in between some big trees and it's almost like coming up on a big car wreck you know yeah. when there's ambulances around and you're just going god i hope everyone's okay and so the first thing you look for are injured people does, is there an emergency here? Do we, what, what kind of help do they need? And then when, you know, you see that everything was clear, Drew stopped, but there were uh, two other boats already helping him. One guy was still uh, turning around and then, you know, he made the assessment Well, everyone's okay. They waved him off and he kept going, but you know, there's always a, a deep concern about injury or, or even worse, you know, when you see something like that and it's scary because those, you know, going 70 to 80 miles an hour, uh, those, those incidences happen so quickly, you just don't have time to react and anything can happen to anyone. Right. Yeah. It, it he claims that he got cut off, however it works, but whatever, basically his boat hooked turning that corner. So the boat ends up on the shore while I looked distracted it was because i was trying to find the pictures in my phone um i can't find them if i was more professional i'd be prepared but but so the boat is on the shore and it looks like it's basically on a trailer like the the outboard and everything it, the nose is pointing towards in the woods in the woods in the woods and the boat is totally out of the water the boat is 100 like 100 out of the water 100 like everything and not just on the edge he was up on the island like he ran, he ramped it up and got into the woods and he was literally like, you're sitting there going, Hey, I don't even know how they're going to get that thing out of there. Hopefully everyone's okay. And you know, the, the situation was everyone's running it's, it's takeoff, you know, there's, uh, 
it, it's a it's a trickle start, but everyone's on everyone's ass, right? Yeah. Everyone's got a fast fast boat and you know everyone's at least running 65 to 66 miles an hour some people are running close to 80 right and so we're running and some of those when, when you come out of the river or when you're running the river into the main lake it's fairly narrow and the channel's narrow because there's so many stumps and trees in that lake that you have to stay in the channel but there you go there you go Keep talking. I'll be I'll be our visuals for the people and so, listening to the audio version right now. If you go to YouTube, yep. you can see me holding pictures. Probably and can't so, see it very well. It's kind of grainy. Where where he where that was was at the end. It was almost at the end of an island or a little peninsula. And so when you come around that corner, the channel's tight, and you there, it's a le, it's a veer left kind of run coming around the end of that point. So you either stay behind the guy that's in front of you. But if the guy that's in front of you is running, you know, significantly slower, then you take either the outside or the inside lane to pass that boat. And I think what happened, I don't know because I didn't see it happen. I'm just making an assessment because of the way we ran that same line. He took the inside, the inside lane, the boat in front of him made his turn and he got sucked into that vacuum that that walk that the wake and literally hooked straight into the island because he was in there perpendicular to that island he wasn't at a 45 degree angle he went shoom. yeah and I, I can't imagine how scary that was yeah i mean when you hook it the boat does a full that's you hook it i mean does a full and if you're close to shore, that's where you end up. If he was way exactly. out in the middle, he would have hooked it. The boat would have settled and, you know, he'd be okay. But he ended up on shore. But this is where, and he I don't know why this wasn't promoted more, but this is what makes the Elite Series so special. Like, could you imagine, like, we've all watched fantasy movies where, I don't even know if it was cars or something, but somebody's car breaks down in a big race. And then the rest of the crew comes out from other teams and they start pushing that. I mean, that doesn't happen in real sports. It happens in Disney. But it does happen in the Bassmaster Elite Series. Another really bad, grainy picture to look at there. But you see a bunch of pros trying to push that boat. And basically what they did was the boat was headed straight in. They pushed the nose around. So the pivot point was now the bottom of the boat, the heaviest part of the boat. But once they got the nose in the water, enough of them, I think there was like eight or nine people that helped. Eight of them. Yep. Push that boat off of um, the shore. And literally he was back fishing five minutes later. Um, yep. So. And I don't even want to start naming the guys who stopped because I know we'll miss somebody, but you know who you are to the pros that were able to help to the marshals that were able to help. Thank you. Because it's moments like that, that make this sport as freaking cool as it is. You took time out of your day of competition to help a comrade out of a sit get out of a situation and i'm sure most of them stopped to see if they were okay first that's your yeah. first reaction is dude are, is everyone okay you know and again man it looks it's like a, it's like on an interstate when everyone's slowing down and you get up to whatever the source of of uh of the whatever's in the way slowing all the traffic down and it's a bad car accident that's what the feeling's like you're just like your stomach's in a knot and you're like, God, I hope everyone's okay. So again, like you, thanks to everyone that stopped and helped Ray out and get back in the water and be, thank goodness. Uh, no one was, was hurt. I don't think he had a marshal in this boat. Thank goodness. No, no, he, he did. I don't think he did. I didn't hear that he did, but, um, it's amazing that he was able to fish. Not only did he get him back in the water, but I mean, I've hooked a boat, but not onto shore. I've hooked, Years ago, I hooked a boat in the middle, but we were actually shooting a commercial um, and it was in the middle lake. Nobody was near. But that is one of those things that like you go through and then it is like an hour later, you start shaking and you realize, you know, what you actually did. But um, he he was able to get his stuff back together and get back fishing. Thanks to he had good a pretty Samaritans. decent day, didn't he? That day? Yeah, I think I mean, so. I think he had like 15 or 16 pounds or something, whatever it was. It was like, wow. What yeah. a recovery. Cause I, I do remember too, you know, seeing it and talking to other anglers, Prosnick specifically, that he was up on his bow when it first happened and he, you know, he was okay. He was standing on his bow and he was like, he was confused and in sh basic, sh basically in shock, you know, not knowing really 
not having a clear head as to what just happened. Yeah. So, yeah. So thank you to all of them that, that yeah. helped out with that and, um, scary experience, but be careful when you're boating. That's why you should wear a life check and have your kill switch hooked up, which he did, which again would have cost an all like you don't wear a kill switch at that moment. That gets a lot worse. Um, but, um, <laughs> I'm thankful that uh, everybody was okay. So after two days with Drew, who'd you end up with? I ended up with one of my favorite people on the Elite Series because he's so acute and so decisive and so, so brilliant at what he does, Greg Hackney. And he makes your day. He's just a pleasant person to be around. I love Greg Hackney. I love being in the boat with him. As I learn every, as I learn something new at every tournament with every angler, I especially learn a lot from Greg Hackney because he's so good at explaining what he's doing. And he's telling you the entire time what he's doing. And when he's on target, ooh, that guy's scary. He is. He is. And uh, I feel like he, and you know from experience, I don't know, I'm sure you've covered him previous to the split, but I feel like today, and he talks about it on stage, I feel like today's Greg Hackney takes all of those moments a lot less for granted and is enjoying the place he is so, so much more than, than not that he didn't enjoy it before, but you know what I mean? It feels like there's a less tense and a more, um, not confident, but a more, at peace, Greg Hackney competing on the Bassmaster Elite Series now. I, I agree. Him and Jason Christie both. Yeah. 100%. They, you know, Greg, we talked about this on the boat, actually, uh, day three and day four. You know, he refers to bass now as us, not mm -hmm. them. And that tells you everything you need to know about how he feels about, you know, where he is, why he came back. And what it what it means to him now, and he's a veteran. I'm telling you know I'm not telling you, but man, people out there that that don't, that don't follow Greg Hackney, like that guy, you talk about a hammer. That guy is like oh. a hammer with a freaking you know loaded barrel on it. I mean, sledgehammer. Holy moly, that guy can fish, and he knows. He just. So the, the amazing thing about what he was doing, particularly on day three, when, you know, he caught, I think 24 pounds or something. Um, he, he was blind. He was blind pitching to these holes, to these beds. He knew there were beds there cause he had a mark, but he couldn't see it because the water, the water was two foot deep, but it was clear. The top half of it was clear and the bottom 12 inches was dark was, you just could not see the bed, but he knew where they were. And so he was blind pitching to him and he knows when he knows when he gets a buck bite and he knows when he gets a big female bite. And he knows where the buck is when he sees a wake and what the buck is doing, even though he can't see the, the, the fish, he knows what that fish is doing based on the wake. And how, how does he know whether it's the buck or the female without seeing it? The side, the, he, immediately he, he can't necessarily always tell, but he's got this keen sense of, of, of detail and when a buck, when the buck makes a, a wake, he can just tell like, and he knows, okay, the buck's on that side of the bed. I'm going to pitch over here and see if I can't catch the female first. And then if he gets, if the buck comes over and he feels it, he, he just knows Yeah. He, he, that guy, that guy is unbelievable. He's he different. really, he really is. He is really I mean, he is tuned into that stuff like no one else, man. Yeah. Yeah. He he's different and different in a good way. Not different in a like, I mean, yeah. you, you know, Hackney is he he's pretty incredible. Um, I tried to get him to trash talk our eventual champion, Joey <laughs> Cifuentes, um, several times at takeoff. But it's like he, he can he's like, Well, you know, the last day was the greatest. He's like you know, I'm not going to trash talk Joey. He's had a great tournament with these young guys and everything. He just builds it up with all these, you know, how amazing the sport is and the future and the young guys and this and that. 
And then at the very end, he's like, but I will step on a man's throat if I get the opportunity. Every and literally, the, every, every, he said everybody it. on the dock, all the anglers, all the media, and everybody was just like, <laughs> <clears throat> and then they just started clapping. They went from gasping like, <laughs> but he, it's. Hacking. He said it like that, too. He said, yeah. I'll, everyone here knows that I will step on everyone's throat if I have to. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, he, go ahead. So, you know, his his ability, he, his, his location where he was fishing um, had a tremendous amount of fish in it. The only two people that were back there were him and Clark Winlet. And they literally had this, you know, neutral zone between them that neither one of them were fishing and they, they, they kept their separate locations and didn't, didn't cross over, never got in each other's way. Didn't even look up at each other. Right. Yeah. And, and Greg's, Greg's spot was like, I'm telling you, it was, it was smaller than a football field. The, the, you know, the whole, the whole thing was, and He's such a predator. He sneaks around in his boat. You know, he just, he'll step on his, his foot pedal and just, just to get his boat going that direction. And then he'll get there just far enough and pull down. Like he is such a predator and he's so detailed. He closes his lockers really quietly. He tiptoes around his boat when he's, when he's in shallow water like that, like he's just so detail oriented and he's a power fisherman, but he's like, he's tiptoeing around yet. When he sets the hook, man, he's like, he sets the freaking hook, you know? Yeah. And, and he's just a, he's just really fun and, and really interesting to be around. And when, you know, when you have a great day, like we did day three and then you go to day four and things aren't working the same, what people don't realize is he didn't run out of fish. Cause that's what people asked me when we got back to the dock. Well, did he run out of fish? No, the fish. And he kept saying, it's not the fish. It's me. And I'm sitting there going, I don't think so, man. I don't think it, it, I think it's the fish. They just, you know, you get, you catch all the easy ones on day one, you catch all the, the less easy, but easier ones on day two and on day three, you know, something magical happens. You just start catching big females or whatever. And on day four, that's when all the Einsteins are left in the water. Yeah. And so he spent a lot of time on fish that he had marked from day one, day two, and day three. Big, big fish. Like he knew they were there and he just couldn't get them to go. I mean, he spent an hour on on one pair that was a six or seven, like a, a unicorn sized female and a big three and a half to four pound male on a bed. And you could see them swimming around. They, they'd float up to the top when the sun came out, you could see her, she'd swim real slowly out into the open, then circle back and go down like a shark into the dark water and completely disappear. Then he would go, now I don't know where she is. You know, and he was like playing this game in his head, trying to catch this fish and he just couldn't do it. His fish were there. They, they just wouldn't, they just wouldn't go for it. Yeah. And I imagine Greg and a lot of the anglers, they expected that wave to continue, but it was the changing water level that kind of pushed them back and held them off. And, um, Joyce Fuentes rode forward facing sonar all the way through to a victory. And with that. Randy Blockett's fins, fist clenches, and he just realizes. <laughs> I mean, I I wonder if Randy gets upset at that, or he's just like, "Wow, I'm going to get a lot of traffic this week." Um, Probably, but that. <laughs> Joey, <laughs> Joey, <laughs> no, I, dude, um, well, let's move on. <laughs> Joey Fuentes, um, two events into his Elite Series career, his mentor Larry Nixon, who he rooms with and did room with at the FLW events, and now still does room with. Um, two events into his elite series career, Joey Sefuentes wins that event and right in the nick of time, because it literally took me that long to get his name perfectly correct. Now I can say, I, I don't think I can say it by itself, like Sefuentes. No, I can't, but Joey Sefuentes, it took me a while to get it down, but the cowboy won. And, uh, again, like we started off this show, how awesome is it that like, I mean, I always say that about the classic, you're about to see somebody's life change. 
but there's two dudes who like going into the season. If you'd have said Tyler Rivette's going to win the first one and Joey Sefuentes is going to win the second one. I don't know what the Vegas odds would be, but they'd be giants. You would have cashed in large and not that they're not great anglers, but if you look at the 103 anglers that you have to skip over to pick those guys, it's tough. I mean, I don't know that those guys would have picked themselves, but just from inexperience, just, yeah. just from inexperience, you know, I mean, anyone at the elite level is a great angler. We all know that. And they sacrifice a lot and they know what they're doing, but from an experience level, those aren't the people that you pick in your fantasy league. Right. Yeah. But, uh, none of that matters. That's why, that's why we go and fish the tournaments because when it was all said and done, Joey Fuentes wins his first elite series title and only his second elite series event, a dominant, uh, victory. You know, I think he needed, I think he was won it by 10 pounds. He needed, I believe he needed nine pounds and he had 19 on the final day. So he won it by 10 pounds. Uh, that tournament was dominated and the area he wanted in is not nothing. He didn't crack a code that nobody else has. Like, I mean, kudos to Davey height, my broadcast partner at events. He started the tournament that morning there, like on day one, Davey height was parked right where he said there was another boat here. And it was Joey Sefuentes, his family or friends that were out there every day. They were waiting for him to arrive. So, um, and, and Davey didn't know that Joey was coming there. He just knew I'm going to park here because stuff's going to happen in this area. And, and Davey was right. Maybe he should unretire and fish the elites because he, <laughs> he, uh, he, he called that one right. And um, for Joey to, and I think the other cool thing was Joey was threatened or, had to deal with some adversity. Like I think if he just goes and blasts them on Sunday, it's not near the victory that it was like that. Those hours of, and I know you were shooting, so you didn't get to really follow it, but watching it, you know, he's losing fish. The fishing isn't as good as it, it has been every single day. The doubts are starting to creep in and to overcome that I think was pretty cool. And I think it was another great uh, winning moment. And you had people, you know, taking the, how many lead changes were there? Like just in that tournament in general, that that was like twenty no, that lead was changes. The first in one. one. <laughs> no, that was the first one they yeah. kept changing because Joey took the lead after day two, I believe, and never relinquished it. Am I correct? Really? I don't know. I thought there was. I thought there like uh, on day three. I thought he fell down. He had like sixteen pounds and and re- no, he uh, led. He led day three. He went in twenty six pounds on day three. I'm talking about uh, day four. When, uh, who was it? Oh, you uh, mean the lead changes throughout the day? Yeah. D- oh, during the day. the day. Yeah. No, there just was a during the day on bass track. Yeah. You know, like Pat Slapper was like smoking him early. He had like 20 pounds by eight 30 or whatever it was. Yeah. And you start seeing these things develop and you're going, Oh, oh. you know, and, and that's the excitement of, of hopefully the, in the accuracy of, of bass track, everyone knows their sandbag to pound or two. So you kind of, you can kind of tell, you know, if everyone's at, when you got 18 pounds on back track, bass track, they probably got about 20 pounds. Right. So yeah. you give everyone a pound and a half to two pounds and you're thinking, wow, like this. And, and even when Joey has 19 pounds, you know, and he's back at the, at the lead, I'm sitting there back there looking at, at Greg Hackney, who's got eight or nine pounds in his boat, but he's got 10 pounds in two fish. He's got a six oh, yeah. pound plus and a four pound plus on one bed thinking any cast, he could catch both of those fish. He could catch the buck, put four more pounds in his live well. Cause he only had four fish. So that adds four full pounds to his weight. Plus he got a pounder, a 12 incher in his, in his well. And if he catches that six or seven pounder, like if he pulls the buck out and that pisses the female off and he catches her on the next, you know, uh, pitch or two, then all of a sudden Joey's at 19, knowing he was five pounds back at takeoff. If he catches another fish and gets up in there at 23 or 24 pound range, like this could change everything. So it's never over till it's over. Right. It's a lot of numbers, Jake. So I know, I, but I feel like I, I'm talking to Ronnie Moore right now. If he catches a five and another five, that's 10 pounds. And then if that guy catches a five and a seven and divided by three, um, 
but but I'm watch. I'm looking at true. his fish. I'm looking at Greg's fish in the water. You know, they're they're there, right there. And, and he's he is ten feet from these fish, pulled down, focused on them. And I'm going, oh my god, this is like, you know, as boring as it is when they're not catching. Sometimes it's really exciting when they're that close to it. You know? Oh yeah, and those tournaments, that's. I mean, you could you overcommit to one giant fish and your tournament goes down, but or you catch said giant fish and it makes your tournament. Um, yeah, no, it was a lot of fun that way. There was a lot of lead changes. Pat Slopper to me was a huge highlight. I mean, I love Pat's since he's I cool met Pat, dude. he's been one of my favorite dudes. Like I, I he's just a nice and, guy. And I've said it on this podcast a bunch of times. The world has not seen Pat. Like, you know what I mean? Like he there's so much you have to go through to, to actually become yourself on camera. I think what we saw on Sunday was real patch lopper. You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden he was in the right position and everything has to line up for it to work. I mean, it's hard to be yourself when you're stressed out and it's not going your way, but when it is going your way, I mean, it, it was, it was pretty awesome to, and that's the coolest thing about the elites. Cause Patch Lopper is no different than a lot of others. There's so many great personalities, but when they finally commit to being real, when they finally commit to just letting it out, it always works. You know what I mean? It always works. Like it, and he, so kudos to Patch Lopper on a great event and uh, great stuff on camera. He, um, I was going off on him after when I'm like, dude, what you did was great. I, I heard Zona say on live, I got to get this guy on my show. But all those are a great sign. Like, that's a good thing to happen for a pro angler. And Corey Johnson was standing right there, and he's like, how was I? And I was like, well, you <laughs> Canadians are still cheering for you, Corey. Uh, I mean, because Corey, I want Corey to have that moment, too. I love Corey, but I, I just too, feel yeah. like on the water, Corey and Chris are very, like, that. I always explain them as they are, they are, drones put on this earth to take titles away from good hard work and pros um and they're, they they're, have their money thieves when it comes to fishing man they they take your money and and run with it and not feel but, bad about it but they're incredibly entertaining too and and i think i think we'll get a taste of them in the future but patch lopper great job um he was real he was awesome and it was really fun to watch this week I, I've got something I would like to say too about someone we haven't talked about yet. And, and I'm back while all this is going down, I'm always rooting for the guy that I'm with who I'm covering. I'm like, I, think I'm, I know I'm, where you're going now, but, but go slowly or, or I'm watching I can too. And I was, I was, uh, secretly cheering for I can to move up. Cause I think he was in ninth or 10th coming out. And he didn't have a great last day, but to see him back in the top 10 was very refreshing. It was almost like, like, I just wanted to go, yeah, man, Ike's back in the top 10. And you go back and look at some of those highlights when he was cat, when he caught some nice fish, he was like, he was like wow. the old Ike and He was like, yeah. <laughs> the energy was breathtaking. And I'm yeah. so glad the the people that we have back, Mercer, like Hackney, Jason Christie, Rosnick, um, Iconelli. I I'm so glad. Swindle, like that, Polinic. Swindle, yeah. Polinic, all those guys. It's so we the right. I mean, you know, I don't want to say this and 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 crit being critical of anyone, anyone out there, because I love everyone, right? But those people that are back are the right people that are back on our circuit. And they are characters that we're all familiar with. And they're all very different. Yet they're all, you know, they're all the, the old school guys that we were, at least our generation remembers. And it's so nice to have those people uh, back in the Bassmaster family. And it makes it makes it better. We're, we're better with those guys in our in our circuit. Yeah. And another example of like the, the internet turning on somebody, Mike Iaconelli, dude. I mean, he qualified to be, he fished three events and qualified. The first time he tried, he went to the opens and qualified and made his way back. And didn't have to. And did, did, right. didn't, yeah, no, I mean, she, sure. He could have applied for the legends deal, but he, he did it. He did it. He did it his way. Yeah. He qualified back, which is incredible. That same off season, he won a kayak event, which is incredible exactly. to think a exactly. dude did 
I mean, it's hard enough to win a kayak event if you're a kayak angler. To take a dude off the front deck of the boat and remove all that those luxuries that you get in a bass boat to win a kayak event is incredible. But he has one bad season on the elites, and I have heard – we've all heard it. I mean, many people listening to this have said it, have heard it, but, like, I can only doesn't know how to fish anymore. And for all the time, I'm like, it's Don't one bad year. Don't forget who he is. And – I think that that Ike's a lot more motivated, a lot more focused. focused. You know what I mean? He, he spent got more that time one season out of his way. You know, there. I mean, a lot of things change when. Obviously, now that we we see this happening, guys coming back, there's a lot of pressure to come back because a you took a lot of criticism for leaving in the first place. Why are you back? All those questions come up, and you know, at the end of the day, it's like all these uh, famous professional athletes say they don't look at the internet, they don't pay attention to what critics are saying. But how can you not? How can you not? You know, let that get into your head and create some pressure. And having gotten that year out of his way last year, um, what he did at Seminole, I, I, I checked every day on Bass Track ever since he came back. You know, I've got like, I've got a handful of guys when I'm on the boat and I'm checking Bass Track to see how everything's going. I, I go all the way down to the very bottom of, of the field, but I only check certain people to see where they are. You know, I always check Lee Livesey. I always check Jason, my friends first. And and Ike's one of those people. And when he's not doing well, deep down inside of me, come on, I'm li literally inside myself going, come on, Ike, you know, catch a big one. Because I want to I want to see him do well because he's so good for the sport. He's good for us. He's good for the brand. And and he's a he's a different kind of Ike than he was 15 years ago. And he's, he's, he is, he is every single person that I talk to that knows him from the guys at, at uncle Larry's outdoors that have been inspired by him and taught by him to Riz at bat and all the guys at bash you every single person that knows him on a very personal level talks about how helpful and how grateful that they are, that they know him and call him a friend. Yeah. And so for that very reason, deep down inside, I always want I can to do well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's great to see him doing well. Another one of the stories that stands out for me from these two events again. Um, and it's a dude who, and I hope he doesn't take this the wrong way. I sent him a big, long text about it. Um, and I really do feel this. It's, it's so wild the way life works out. Like, and I don't want to get all deep and crazy, but you take somebody like Brandon Card, who's qualified for classics. He's a former rookie of the year and everything. But I think Brandon's, you know, personality isn't, he's not Mike Iaconelli. He doesn't stand out in a crowd. You know what I mean? And um, it's wild how I've just watched these last two weeks. I mean, a month ago, he didn't think he'd be fishing. Like he was in a hospital. He had um, meningitis, I believe. And that prompted um, Bell's palsy, which Bell's palsy. paralyzes half of your face. So half of his face is drooped down. We've all seen people with Bell's palsy. He could wake up tomorrow. It could be gone. Um, and it will be one day. But he literally went from not thinking he could make it to like, I'm going to have to miss the first two elite series events, take a medical hardship and not make it. And not only does he make it, but he top tens the first one, has a good finish in the second one, makes the first cut in the second one. And dude, here's the crazy thing. It just blows me away how, and this is what my text when I sent him this was, it's amazing how something so negative in your life in some ways, like when you're going through stuff, you search for a silver lining to tell people to make them feel better. But sometimes the silver lining just appears right in front of you. And I mm -hmm. think that that, in my opinion, like, trust me, he wishes he never went through this, but he also knows that there's a lot of people going through a lot worse than what he's dealing with. But if you look at like his social media numbers, the amount of support he's getting now, all of a sudden, if I listen to the pop from the crowd when he comes up, but it's just so cool to see something so negative happen in somebody's life. And you could have told him at the time, well, this is positive. This is that. But but to have the amount of support around him, not only is it going to fuel him to have a full recovery, but it's just amazing how. 
but just being real, being honest, and being a little bit vulnerable. Just put yourself in that position, walking on that stage, talking a different way than you normally talk, looking a different way you normally look. You have to tape your eye closed through competition because he's you're blind. Eye- he's basically blind. I mean, uh huh. He can't. He's doing this with one eye. Yeah. Did someone have to drive his vehicle, his rig, from Okeechobee to? Uh, Seminole, someone yeah, well, Bowman got in there and took him, made, Bowman made, did. made sure That's he was right. safe, you know, for yeah. the whole team. And <laughs> Bowman took the bullet for him, and uh, probably halfway through it, Carver was like, Stop talking, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, good job, Bowman. That was awesome, yeah. Um, but you know, he's to stop every hour and put eye drops in because it, the eye's not blinking and all these, but ultimately. By just being real, by being open, being honest, and being a little bit vulnerable, it's so wild how such a negative in some ways has been a positive for him. Not just the feeling of love, but the people that he inspired. There's people out there dealing with this and so many other things that he's inspiring. So I think it was just pretty cool. Pretty cool to see that. At the end of the day, you know, we, we're we storytellers. We're, we're, we pull stories out of these events to make, you know, to make television, to make the entertainment, to make it more interesting. But at the end of the day, that's really the true story of the first two events of the 2023 season is Brandon Card going through this, you know, really helplessly and sticking to it and not walking away, taking a medical hardship and, and, and go and going after it. That's how much he loves it. That's how much he doesn't want. It's more important to him to stick around than it is for him to go away and just try to deal with this, you know, in the, in the darkness of his own home. If, if that's where you would go, if you spent, you know, time thinking everyone else is out there and here I am feeling sorry for myself with one eye and I've got this thing. I don't know when it's going to go away if ever it will one day, but I don't know when, and he's just like, I'm just going to keep fishing. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty freaking cool, dude. It's very cool. And, you know, now he heads to the classic, which is a body of water he should do very well in. That's where he spent a lot of That's time in lived. that part of the world. That's where he lived. So um, kudos to him and kudos to all of the fans and everybody that have reached out to him. Like, I've just been like, I look at some of his social media posts and there's 500 comments and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, see, it's just it, and dude, if you would have, ta- if I had, a, if you'd have thought of it and told it to him a month ago, it wouldn't have mattered. But to see it and to feel it, I mean, it's got to be overwhelming in many ways. But um, and helpful, so helpful, yeah, so helpful to get through the adversity, and ha- knowing that there's that many people on your side that you don't even know that are rooting for you. The the world is a good place. There are good people in this, in the world. And that's when it shines, when people show up with, you know, five words in response in the comment section of your, you know, your post on social media saying, go, you go boy, or we love you, man, hang in there, get better soon. And all those things, those are the things that really matter in life. You know, it's it's really, really great, man. And ultimately, it gives people a chance to connect with him for reasons other than where he lives. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's uh, he, He's just being real. And um, it's very cool. It's very cool. Um, so it was, it was two amazing events. Um, I feel like we haven't talked about Joey Cifuentes enough because he won. Um, I, don't, I don't know enough about him. I, I'm really yeah. interested. If you have any insight on his relationship with Larry Nixon, that's intriguing to me. Well, they, they live close to each other. So I think that's where it kind of started from. Um, but I mean, Joey, I mean, he's one of those dudes who literally has, I mean, he's one of, one of the dudes that you don't ever hear anything bad about him. You know what I mean? Like uh, we both work with Berkeley, you know, any of the Berkeley folks I've talked to about him are just like, they rave about him. He's a good person. Um, That's what everyone says about him. Yeah. I've heard nothing but good things about him. Yeah, he really is just one of those good guys, and it's awesome to see he's been close before. You know, he's won some tournaments from the back of a boat. He's had leads in tournaments, but it's awesome to see that he makes it arguably, I don't think that arguably, to the biggest stage of his career. And that's when it happens. But again, right. that's it's it's all the build. You know what I mean? It's the it's the him being close in the past that that makes people that 
into his victory. Um, and uh, it, it was cool. It was cool. But I mean, the tail is, you know, two, t- two tournaments in a row were dominated with forward facing sonar. And um, I feel like anglers are going to stop looking along the shoreline. I feel <laughs> <laughs> if they do, that's when the guys on the shoreline are going to start winning. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I mean, not that they don't already, but I'm just saying, Hey man, you know, you just do, we just don't know what's going to happen and how this is all going to air itself out and develop in different ways that we don't even see coming yet, you know, yeah. and getting back to Joey Sifuentes, he reminds me of Donald uh, Cerrone, the UFC guy that where they call him well, the comes out to the same song and th- that's all they got yeah. is a song and a hat <laughs> yeah. similar, I mean, I know, very different. I, but I know, but you know how uncomfortable, I, and this is no knock on him. Kudos to him for being able to do it. But, dude, I cannot fish or even shoot, you know, sh- cover these guys in jeans. I cannot. It's so uncomfortable. Every When I see him in, in his highlights and he's wearing, you know, area jeans and a cowboy hat, I'm like, dude, I mean, you go, boy. He's doing it his, his way, you know. And like we always talk about, everyone – has got a different character and everyone has a different type of marketability, whether it's a showmanship or they're just being themselves. And, you know, now winning that event with the big brand, that's a, that's a big brand cowboy hat boy. And, uh, and and that's a unique, he has a unique style just about himself. Right. But it's him though. You know what I mean? Like if somebody, Corey Johnson decided to be the cowboy and started yeah. wearing a hat. It wouldn't It'd work because that's not no, who he is. Um, right. it's, that's not it's who we know who him Joey man. is. And, um, and that's why it works. Um, but, uh, no kudos to him. A great event. Um, the and, crowd uh, again, the crowd, oh, again, the bridge, crowd. the bridge that comes across the canal that goes into the, to the, uh, the, or the boat docks there. The, again, the two points at the mouth of, of the canal that comes out into the river, there's crap. We come in on, and it was like that on, on Saturday, but even more so on Sunday, hordes of people on the both points, cheering all the guys coming in the top 10, the people standing on the bridge. It was like, it's like a, I mean, they're professional athletes. It's, it's just like, anything you know any event where crap hordes of people want to be there just to say they were close to these guys because they look up to them and they want to see they want to see these big fish and and they want to see these superstars come in and weigh their fish it's really 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 cool yeah it's very cool uh great crowds and uh now next for us is Knoxville, Tennessee, the Bassmaster Classic. So everybody come. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be insane. It was last time we were there. old stomping grounds. I love Knoxville. Yeah. I go back as a Tennessee fan. And to have Bassmaster there, like I tell all my friends, one of my really good buddies that I went to school in Knoxville with owns a a franchise, uh, a local franchise, a barbecue place called Archer's Barbecue. And he just opened a new restaurant called uh, Fire and Smoke. And it's a high-end barbecue restaurant, but it's really nice. So I hope we can all get together and go eat there when we're in Knoxville. You're really amazing at sliding in those plugs. Dude, he's my buddy. And it's really good food. And it's southern barbecue at its best. He was born and raised in Memphis. And Memphis is one of those towns like Kansas City that's famous for their own barbecue style. So Uh I had to throw it in there. Okay. So if if me and you go there, we're going to get like a sandwich or something for free? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. good, good. If we go there together, we'll get hooked up. If we go there with a big group, I don't think so. If (laughs) I go there without you... (laughs) still screwed you're screwed <laughs> <laughs> hey speaking of kansas city here's a cool weird little thing that happened the last two weeks um and you don't have to love football to love this but i think i don't know a soul on earth that did not love the version of the national anthem that chris stapleton oh. did at, at the super bowl i mean even if you don't watch the super bowl you've seen that by now most people it was one for the ages and it was incredible um so it's funny at the first event I got talking, obviously a lot of people were congratulating me. I'm winning the Super Bowl because believe it or not, I did just a couple of weeks ago. I won the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, I had a lot to do with it. Um, but they said, oh, that's, you know, that became a conversation. And they're like, that should be 
the anthem that we play at Bassmaster events. So um, myself and Lisa went to our DJ and said, hey, we, we, we got to find a version of that, rip it from YouTube or whatever, and uh, play it. So we played it. It was really cool because, I mean, the first time I actually saw Leanne Swindle crying during it, it was just it's an emotional it's very cool. So it's a great anthem. But you can hear the this, crowd, the Super Bowl yeah. crowd getting loud in the middle of it. Like it's ant, uh, gets jacked. It's all it's red, white, and blue too, man. I mean, that yeah. is as American as it gets. And it's it's not studio audio, it's audio from live. the event. So, like you said, it's you live. hear the crowd reacting and everything. So I'm like, this is great. The first time we played it, I'm like, and then this little surprise came out of nowhere. Um, that is just the gift that keeps on giving to me. Um everybody that's ever been to a chiefs game or watched chiefs game on tv you know at the very end they, it ends with the land of the chiefs right you got to give the big chiefs so when every bassmaster take off home of the free land of the chiefs you hear it in the background it's not very i mean you can hear it it's it's not as loud as i'd like it to be but it's it it's own my own little sick little thing that i'm like ah it's cool how the me and Mike McKinnis are excited about it anyways. Others not so much, but it's a great anthem. And uh, it's the one we play at Bassmaster events now. I think that what I was thinking, we played it three times in two events. The first two events, we played it three times. Yeah, I think they're not trying to overuse it or something. That Well, I was thinking, because the first day they play, or the first two days they played it back to back. Or they played it at in the, morning, the takeoff and, and they it. played it at the weigh-in. And I was like, please don't wear this out because this is yeah. so great. Don't wear it out. So I started thinking my before that, my favorite version of of the national anthem is Whitney Houston's. Like that gets me, it doesn't get me pumped up, but it's so high energy and her voice is so beautiful. I'm like, we should swap back and forth between Chris Stapleton and Whitney Houston. And then we have the perfect national anthem. We have the perfect versions of the national anthem at Bassmaster events. Well, we'll get to That's work on take. that. That's my take. That's we'll get... Jake's take on the national anthem. <laughs> we will get to work on that. Here's another thing that happened at the end of takeoff on day, on the final day at um, Seminole. I mean, we talk about how hard Takumi Ito and a lot of the Asian anglers work when they're here. And it was never better displayed that literally takeoff's done. The 10 boats leave. And the first person to walk up to me is Takumi Ito that morning. He's not in the top 10, obviously. And he's walking up to me not to talk to me. He's actually walking up to me because Lisa's standing there and he wants to talk to Lisa to make sure it's okay for him to launch his boat. To go fishing. At takeoff right there. <laughs> and go fishing and make some content and everything. And so I watched him all day long while, you know, the adage is you want to just lick your wounds and recover from a tough one he's on the water and fishing and um studying yeah getting better getting better that's what yeah. he's doing and those japanese guys man i say this and my mom's japanese and so i have you know an affection for the japanese anglers just like i mean everyone does but there's something a little bit deeper for me because my mom's japanese and I understand their language barrier. I understand their cultural barrier. They're all, they are, and none of them hang out with each other. They're all like, they're all like, they all do their own thing. And that's kind of the Japanese way. They don't share information. They're extremely secretive to everything that they do. They're bringing baits and techniques over from Japan and mostly ultra, ultra finesse uh, styles. And they're extremely, extremely good at what they do, right? We all know that. Kenta, Taku, Fujita now, they're all really, really good at what they do. And I'm leaving some people out. It's because I can't say their last names. <laughs> but the, the thing about them, too, is I, I, I feel like I relate to them, relate them to or parallel them to what Puerto Rican or Latino baseball players are to the major league baseball game as Japanese anglers are to American bash now, because 
they're coming over here. They're more and more gaining ground in the open. There's more people, you know, they're sacrificing their lives in Japan to come over here and chase a dream. And I just want to give a big shout out to those Japanese anglers that are here that have made that sacrifice and commitment to do what they're doing and chase that dream. Good for you. And I'm, I'm always rooting for you. hundred yeah. percent. Koya Fujita with a top two finish in this one, which is another cool, that cool moment when I looked and I didn't think about it till it happened. I'm looked and I'm like, so it's either going to be this rookie, this highly touted rookie. Like you talk to Japanese people about Fujita. He's as touted he's man. as anybody ever. And it, and with good reason. I mean, he qualified his first attempt through the opens. He also finished second in an event, two events into his career. Um, throwing, look at the top baits gallery on bassmaster.com. It is nuts. Like he literally threw a bait that looked like a sugar cube a chiclet with some <laughs> skirt coming through it. It's just yeah, I don't even know what it is, but it's cool. And um, and Zona pointed out, like, I mean, some earth shattering hook sets from him and and that's not you know takumi ito has said i'm not strong and i asked him about that in stage and he's like well takumi ito's not strong it sounded like he was telling me i am and uh, uh it, it's uh it's awesome to see it's just awesome to see that stuff going on um i have one question for you though we're going super long but i wanted to ask you this when you started talking about hackney so when he's precise like that, when he's like taking his time to close his compartments and do all, you know, he tiptoes around. Is that harder for you as a camera person? Like, are you more nervous? Like if I, if you're with somebody slamming compartments and stuff, I would think it would be less nerve wracking than being with the super quiet guy. I learned, I learned from covering Jason Christie in the past to be quiet because a, I had so much respect for him when I saw him doing it. Like the first time I was in his boat, I just did it because I knew he was being quiet. So I felt like I needed to be quiet. I didn't want to distract him. Hell, I didn't even want to eat my crackers. Cause I felt like he could hear my crackers crunching in my mouth when I'm eating them. <laughs> so I'm quiet about everything, but I think, I think, so I'm quiet with everyone, but I think, like when Greg Hackney does it, it doesn't make me nervous, but I don't like, I don't move around much on the back of the boat. I might have to take two steps to the right to get a better angle to, to the left when he's pitching out to his left or vice versa, the other side, but it's always a two step move from center where the back, uh, back seat would be. That's where, that's my center, right? And I take two steps and two steps and I reach the, the gunnel of the, the back of the boat and I know where I am. And so when I'm fishing with Greg Hackney, especially in calm water, if the boat's facing forward and if I step too hard, then I make a wake off the front of the boat that projects into the bed where the fish are. So I make sure that I'm really quiet and very deliberate with my moves but real easy so that I don't cause a problem for the angler. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I don't get nervous. I just do it. Well, while you were telling that, it reminded me, and I can't believe we didn't talk about this, but you, uh, one of my favorite things about you is you've become a elite series pin cu cushion and it just helps this podcast. You took another shot this week. You've talked about the Bobby Lane shot. You took another shot. Oh, you can see it. You can see it even on, it, Dude, I, I, I almost feel like the it collar cracked bone. my collarbone. Like it's still really hackney? sore. And there's a, yeah, hackney. He was throwing that swim jig and he set the hook. A fish came up. He was burning it across the top and a fish came up and missed it. And he set the hook and that, I could hear it coming. And, went, and it hit me and I went, oh man. And so it was sticking there. I had a, a, a sun hoodie on. It was sticking there. And I thought, oh, man, the hook's in me because it, it didn't fall to the ground when it hit me. And so Greg's like reeling it in. And he's trying to get it off. I'm going, wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. <laughs> I said, give me some slack. Give me some slack because I thought the hook was in me. So he turns around and he gives me some slack. And when I touched it, it fell. And I had my sunglasses looped down around with my leash on it. And it fell 
between my glasses and hit the hit the deck and so i'm trying to pull it up through and greg's again now once it hits the ground it's like okay i can get it now give me my lure he's like, i'm going wait 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 because i'm thinking he's gonna pull this thing up and the hook's gonna catch me in the chin so he actually did walk back there and he goes are you okay and i said actually that hurt like that got me right in the collarbone and i said is there a mark and I pulled my, I pulled it down. He goes, Oh dude, I really did get you. Didn't I? And I said, did you hear it? And he just started laughing. He goes, dude, it sounded like hit a watermelon <laughs> when it hit. <laughs> so yeah, I took it and it, it's still sore. It's been what that was day three. So it's been several, a few days since that happened, but I'm okay. I'm not complaining. It's just one of those things, man. Thank God oh. it didn't hit me in the mouth. Yeah, collarbone is a painful spot to take it though. That's it uh, is sore. So when you when you told Hackney it, it hurt, did he look sympathetic to you or was he just like he said he was sorry like six times? I go, dude, it's not your fault. It's actually mine because I know when I get that 45 degree angle over the shoulder, especially on top water, I know that I'm in the line of fire. Cause when they set the hook, it's literally it's almost like a reverse follow through. I'm right where the that the tip of that rod is is lined up with. So you know you're. I've been. That's the fourth time I've been hit this year already. Mostly the with fourth Steve time Kendi. you've been hit this year. Steve Candy hit me twice with a frog though, so it didn't hurt. Oh my god! Yeah, I've already been hit four times this year. <laughs> When Who hit me the in the people leg? for the ethical treatment of camera operators? I think Larry Larry Nixon hit me in the. Oh in well, the that's leg. an honor though. Stop whining yeah, about yeah. that. I mean, yeah, people would no. love to get hit by a I legend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Nixon hit you in the leg with what? Uh, I probably uh, I guess a swim jig because he was throwing uh -huh. that quite a bit. Yeah. But that was no big deal. Just no big deal. Steve Candy hit me with a frog twice, and then. And then Greg Hackney hits me with it's still that that Hackney hit that fat I, I think I posted a, a, a story about it, and I said I, this is what happens when you take a fastball from Greg Greg Hackney, <laughs> but but still the Bobby Lane was that one that one that one sent me to the deck that was like down goes Jake down goes Jake <laughs> dude and I think Bobby Lane would be upset if he ever gets beaten like he I think he like when you at, when oh, I asked takes him about it, he's like that. oh yeah hell yeah that happened <laughs> that absolutely I was so proud of when I watched that podcast and he said oh that absolutely happened 100 I was like yeah you tell him boy I wasn't lying <laughs> I didn't think you were lying I just no no I don't think you did but you know, when People someone, did. when, when someone validates it like that, it's like, uh-huh, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well. I mean, a lot of people complained that there was no Jake to take in the off season. Well, those same people, I hope you watched all of this because this was a long, long version of this, but dude, it's good to have you back on the podcast. And now we'll be back on regularly after elite series events and the Bassmaster classic and, uh, Lots of cool stuff ahead. This is show 99. So next week's show, you know, so don't say it. We got a super guest next week, a super guest. A lot of people had to work to make this happen. And I am thankful for all of those people, but um, I'm excited about next week, but it's still hard to believe that this is show 99. I mean, you've done a lot Wayne of Gretz I'm, I'm so happy to be, I'm honored to be the Wayne Gretzky show. That's, yeah. I'm, I'm, ha I'm honored to be 99 behind the hundredth interview the podcast that you're going to do and uh you know I'm, I'm just honored to be here thank you so much dave mercer for allowing me to be a part of this it's it's really great there's i get a lot of feedback from people out there from from the boat ramps to social media uh private messages and i really appreciate uh and have a lot of fun being a part of this thank you yeah. I mean, dude, you don't have to thank me. Uh, I mean, I enjoy them. I enjoy these conversations and, and I think it's just the people that watch them that should be thanked because, you know, when we first started doing these, we're like, does anybody want to hear our conversations that we have along the dock? You know, That's and how you guys started. have been super supportive and um, it's really, really cool to, cause, cause for me, I, these events happen and it's like the moments fly past you so quick and 
you don't remember a lot of the stuff. And then we have these conversations and it's, it's like, um, it's good for me. It's good. It's, it's, it's closure on events or whatever. Um, the next classic just got announced this morning too. Did you see that? No. Where is it? Did you say? Well, yeah, it just got announced this morning. So sure. Everybody knows by this point, but it is, we are going back for the first time since 2016, the Bassmaster classic will return to Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2024. And with that, wow. your buddy, Jason Christie is probably doing a happy dance. Cause I know oh. he wants another shot at that one. Wow. Yeah. I, I think he'll be there in Knoxville too. I think he'll be, he'll, he'll, he's going to be in play at the yeah. classic. Yeah. Um, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll talk lots about the classic coming up. We've got lots of stuff. For that and uh, show 100 next week. Thank you all for tuning in today. You got anything else, Jake? Are we are we, are we done? I think we're done. We talked about as, a lot and more. Yeah, lots. We talked about lots, but thank you for sharing it all with us. And um, Bob Cop, take it away. Wow, that's very official. <laughs> very very official. Thanks for watching. Please like comment, and subscribe, because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?